treatment of insomnia. So this is another presentation that you I'm going to be referring to the um, the sedative hypnotic and axolytic lecture. There's going to be some drugs there that I'll be kind of referencing to. So it'd be advantageous to listen to that presentation before listening to this treatment of insomnia, um, just because I'll be making references to that lecture. But there's also going to be three medications in here that you guys have not seen on other lectures. So please stay tuned for that. Three new medications that yes, are testable. Um, yes, please prepare for those on the test. There's some newer ones, or there's some ones that didn't really fit in other places, or I had trouble fitting them in other places. And anyway, so you'll see those here in this presentation. Medications. So this is what we care about, right? Drugs. Because we like drugs. Okay, I promise I'm not going to sing to you guys. I just, there's a microphone in front of me. I just got to, you know, you just got to sing sometimes, you know? Uh, <laughs> or you don't know. Okay, but anyways, classes we've seen before. Um, melatonin agonists are the new ones. And doxepin, we haven't seen these two yet. But benzodiazepines, non benzodiazepines, hypnotics. Um, like with cholesterol, hypertension, etc., um, you do need to think about lifestyle modifications first with these medications. So what they have this thing called sleep hygiene. I'd encourage you guys to look into that. Um, they may be teaching you guys about it in ICM, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. But if not, sleep hygiene, it's on up to date. It's all over the place. But it's just basically, it's a lot of lifestyle modifications you can recommend for your patients. And I'm not going to go through them all right now, but uh, lifestyle modifications, go through with your patients that can help them a lot. Um, and you also want to do a kind of a benefit risk analysis with these medications because unfortunately some of these medications like the benzodiazepines we talked about before they have abuse potential they have uh they, you can get physically dependent with them uh, there is tolerance issues etc um and then even with some of the other newer agents um there's some adverse effects and stuff that can be problematic um and then too related to the sleep sleep hygiene if sometimes if you don't fix that underlying problem that you know is causing the sleep disturbances or the insomnia the pharmacological agents can be kind of a band-aid. So giving a benzodiazepine can kind of be a band-aid approach maybe. Um, so I'm not saying never, you know, you guys are gonna be practitioners and you gotta do what you gotta do and your patients are your patients and everybody's different, but uh, just things to take in consideration that you don't want to just be doing kind of band-aid treatment with a sleep disorder if you can avoid it. Medications, okay. So um, there's risks that may be increased in certain clinical settings. So I would look, go ahead and read through these. But some of the things that kind of jump out at me that, you know, you always need to be thinking about older adults. Um, I mean, thinking about that pregnancy, alcohol consumption, right? Their kidneys and liver, um, if they have sleep apnea or not, or if they're nighttime decision makers, which is maybe you guys, if you work the night shift as a PA, um, you don't or you rather you shouldn't be taking like let's say lorazepam or benzodiazepine lorazepam or something right before starting your shift if you work the night shift or taking an Ambien a uh, Zolpidem is another medic sleep medication it wouldn't be a good idea to take that right before you are going on the shift so look at these I like these um, definitely highlight all this put a star by this whole slide um, want to make sure you guys know that these are some the risk and it, these can um, influence your prescription choices in the future. Choice of agents. So unfortunately, there's not um, a lot of research done on this. You can see there aren't a lot of randomized controlled trials that can directly compare agents head to head. Um, so that is something to take in consideration. Um, other than with there have been comparisons or indirect comparisons with benzodiazepines and non-benzodiazepines, um, they seem to have a similar similar impact. But um, you still need to be concerned about the adverse effects. So typically, benzodiazepines have worse adverse effects, and again, abuse potential, et cetera, than the non-benzodiazepines. So that is something to take into consideration. Okay, so choice of agent is going to depend on the patient, as usual. Um, so for patients with sleep onset insomnia, um, so this is people that are having trouble going to sleep. Um, typically, it's just that little like boost that they need just to go to sleep. A shorter acting medication can help with them. So here's some examples of shorter acting medications. Uh, you pay attention or you know star those, highlight those. And then if people have uh, problems with sleep maintenance, so this is the people that have problems staying asleep. So it's you know you're with your patients and it, and patients usually don't say oh I have sleep onset insomnia or I have sleep maintenance issues. They usually say I have trouble going to sleep. So you think that's sleep onset or I have trouble staying asleep. That's that's sleep maintenance. Or I have trouble going to sleep and staying asleep. 
So they have problems with both sleep onset and sleep maintenance. Um, so those are all, you know, depend, depends depend on your patients. Sleep maintenance or the staying asleep, you want to think longer acting. So they make extended release products, but then they also have medications that have longer half-lives. Um, so that is something that could be a strategy to, to pick those. Um, with Having said that, though, with the extended release products, longer acting ones, you have to be con concerned with what is called a hangover effect. Um, and so this is basically, these are longer acting medications. So the person needs to be mindful about, so let's say it's a 12 hour preparation of uh, extended release products, Zolpidin, Ambien. They need to be mindful about when they take it. So they can't be like, oh, I'm gonna take it. Um, I know I'm gonna go to bed like 10 o'clock, so, but I need to be up at six in the morning. Well, that's less than the 12 hours. So if they take it at 10 o'clock, they try to wake up at six in the morning, they may be groggy, have a hangover effect, they may not be able to wake up, they may be, have slurred speech, seem drunk or whatever, you know, it's, it's not not a good deal. So that is definitely something that you need to be mindful of with your patient that, you know, if they are having problems with sleep maintenance, you know, even if they don't necessarily want to go to sleep right at 6 p.m., 7 p.m., you know, if it's a 12-hour preparation or 12-hour extended release product or if it has a longer half-life or whatever, um, then they need to be mindful about when they take their medication. So maybe take it right after dinner. Um, and then also, too, just, I mean, when they're first taking it, it's also going to depend on how it affects them. So some people take it, they fall asleep right away. Some people, it takes them a while. Um, that's just going to, again, be kind of patient-specific. But um, definitely important to know the, the difference, or that rather there is some strategy if it's problems going to sleep, patient has a problem going to sleep, patient has a problem staying asleep. They also have people that awake in the middle of the night, uh, so they do have some quicker acting sublingual forms. So with the sublingual or in the buccal cavity, you do get faster absorption of medication. So that is a strategy to sometimes get a faster kind of, but again, depending if they're waking up at three in the morning and they have to be up at six in the morning, they take this medication at three in the morning, they may have problems waking up. Um, but yeah, they need at least four hours of time in bed remaining after administration. So again, that 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. scenario wouldn't work. So that's something to be, the patient needs to be mindful of. And again, it's, it's all part of that, um, or to, it's part of that sleep hygiene, that whole like, what's going on sleeping? What's, what, what issues do you have? Are you too hot? Are you too cold? Is it too bright? Um, you know, et cetera. The other thing you have to think about too is costs and adverse effects. So newer drugs, usually more expensive. And then adverse effects, definitely. We've, I've touched upon that up before. Please refer to my other lecture as far as specific adverse effects that you have to be worried about. Um, but usually the older ones are cheaper because they have generic and the newer ones are brand name only and they're a lot more expensive. Doxepin, so this is one that we hadn't talked about previously, but I want to make sure you guys are, it's covered here. We will probably be visiting again in the psych, psychiatric module, but I just want to make sure we got it here. It's category, as you noticed, so I said psych, it is a tricyclic antidepressant. Box warning on this one, this is true for all antidepressants, but definitely pay attention to this. Unfortunately, antidepressants have an increased risk of suicidality suicide ideation, et cetera, with antidepressant drugs. So you're going to be seeing this again in the psych module, but just note that, start, that this is a, a true for doxepin as well. Also note too, part of the box warning, doxepin is not approved for the use in pediatric patients, so please read through all of that. Um, use depression and or anxiety, which we'll talk about later, but insomnia too. So this can um, help with uh, sleep maintenance, so that person who has trouble staying asleep. Adverse reactions, um, there are different adverse effects you have to be concerned with. Um, definitely read through all of these. Uh, CNS adverse effects definitely are there. Sedation's there. It's one of those adverse effects that actually is considered maybe beneficial because for an insomnia patient, or if a person has depression and they have insomnia, this could be a strategy to give them this antidepressant that causes sedation. Um, so, so anyways, that's something to look at, but definitely read through all of these. Um, so CNS, GI adverse effects are usually more common, but um, I definitely want you guys to, to look <clears throat> look and make sure you read through all of these. More adverse effects here. Um, just go ahead and read through these. But, um, you know, mainly, again, it's CNS and GI adverse effects. But um, here are some more here. Contraindications, um, glaucoma, uh, urinary retention. They cannot be used in combination with MAO inhibitors. Bad drug interactions there. Um, so, and those are drugs that we haven't covered yet, but this is another class of antidepressants that it shouldn't be, um, used for. 
So, um, and then allergic cross-reactivity for other trisulfonic antidepressants. They are chemically structured close enough. That could be an issue there. Uh, mechanism of action here is, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> for its antidepressant properties, it affects the serotonin and norepinephrine, which we'll talk about more later, but read, read that. And then for the, for sleep maintenance, it's specifically, they are H2 blockers. They are antihistamine, um, like medications, they antagonize the H1 receptor, so they actually cause a person drowsiness. So that's like the first generation antihistamines. Um, they have drowsiness as an adverse effect, similar to that. Um, but anyways, and they can also be off-label used for chronic urticaria, but um, because of its effect on the histamine um, receptors and its histamine blockade. Here's a newer one here, uh, the Belsomra. Um, categorization, it's a hypnotic miscellaneous. Like I said, it wasn't in the other presentation, so please make sure you add this to your other notes and have it as part of your tables, etc. But it's an orexin receptor antagonist, receptor, orexin receptor blocker, used for insomnia. Um, so this is used for both onset and or sleep maintenance, so it could be a potential strategy if a patient has trouble going to sleep and staying asleep. Um, it is newer, though, so it is more expensive than some of your older therapies, so that could be something to think about. Adverse reactions, again, CNS, adverse reactions are a big one, and uh, G GI. Um, drowsiness, you notice, but that is something that um, is maybe a desirable adverse effect. Um, you notice, too, that there is more common adverse effects with women than men, so note that, look through those, interesting. Um, sometimes you see that with medications, but sometimes it's not common. But anyways, this is one where uh, there sometimes can be some more common uh, adverse effects with women, with your female patients. Uh, contraindications, just narcolepsy you have to worry about. Uh, concerns related to adverse effects here, we have abnormal thinking, behavioral changes, so that can be something that can be problematic and may be an issue too if a person or a patient already has some psychiatric issues. That may be a rationale to not um, prescribe this. CNS depression, so it can be bad enough to um, to affect a person's driving, etc. So, um, so that's something to to think about. The sleep paralysis, which is super freaking scary and just freaks me out. I don't know. There's, I feel like this happened to me once or twice where like I feel like I'm awake but I can't move. But anyways, I don't want to get into my weird <laughs> experiences. But unfortunately, that can happen, um, and it really freaks people out, and they don't like it. Um, so that's something that, that can happen. Um, and then sleep-related activities. This is also with like your Ambien and, and some of your other uh, non-benzodiazepine um, sleep aids. They unfortunately also have the sleep-related activities. This is where people are like eating food, driving around, making phone calls, or having sex um, while they're asleep. So um, we actually, they're a friend of ours. My my wife and I had a friend, one of our friends in medical school that the um, the husband had the problem with the uh, having sex while asleep. So it's kind of funny, but it's also kind of scary, and the wife was freaked out by it. Um, so serious and people freak out about it and it's not good especially too if you're having sex with just random people or i don't know but anyway so sleep related activities i don't want to don't want to spend too much time on that but anyway yeah sleep related activity is another concern with it uh disease related concern i touched upon the depression already um so maybe not a good idea to be a, a something to use if a person already has some other psychiatric issues drug abuse is another one too and then hepatic impairment um they warned against being used as a hepatic impairment. Um, and then related to the adverse effects, there can be some respiratory disease too, so something to, to worry about there. Mechanism of action, so we hadn't talked about this before, but it's the it blocks the binding of wake-promoting neuropeptides, orexin A and orexin B, um, to their receptors, and then this is thought to suppress wake drive. So this is one of those mechanism of actions that's not fully elucidated, but they um, it is an orexin blocker. Um, but anyways, and so that's uh, what's going on there. Read through that. Another new medication, the Hetlioz. Tassimeltion, another hypnotic miscellaneous. This one is specifically a melatonin receptor agonist. Uh, newer medication too, came out a couple of years ago. Uh, mechanism of action there, it is, you know, it's a melatonin agonist. So uh, stimulates the melatonin receptor, specifically one and two used for non 24 hour sleep wake disorders. Interesting note here, the efficacy was established in totally blind patients with non 24 hour sleep wake disorders. So that's from the manufacturer. They noted that and that was part of the research, whatever. So um, 
longer term, this is a newer drug. It's more expensive. It's not super popular, but longer term, it'll be interesting to see if this one, the efficacy of this, and see if it's really something that kind of sticks around and, and is working. Adverse reactions, most common CNS. Adverse reactions, specifically headache. Um, not related to male or female here, you'll notice. Um, but yeah, so that's something that can happen. Also related to CNS is abnormal dreams, which again, can be fun sometimes, abnormal dreams, maybe. I don't know if you guys like abnormal dreams, but sometimes I like them. Sometimes I don't like them. So these are ones that um, it's just going to depend on your patient, and it may be a reason to stop them, stop taking it. Hepatic, so uh, toxicity potential there. Um, we want to be concerned about potential liver enzyme increase. That's something to watch out for. Um, UTIs can be problematic. Um, again, depending on your patient, if a patient's prone to it, um, this may be neat reasons for them to not use it. And then upper respiratory tract infections as well, um, something there that you may need to be concerned while the patient is taking this medication. Contraindication, so far, there's none. And I say so far because sometimes with newer medications, they first come out and it's like, they don't have any adverse effects. They don't have any contraindications. This medication is amazing. It's a miracle drug. Hallelujah. No, and then it they turn out like in five, 10 years and they have a ton of contraindications and box warnings and they're like killing people. And okay, sorry, I got kind of dark there. But yeah, it's just so for now, no contraindications. But I kind of feel like stay tuned because this is what happens with a lot of new drugs. It's like there's no contraindications. Um, warnings, precautions, there are some CNS depression. Uh, we talked about that. And so this is, it makes sense, you know, it, you're using it to go to sleep. So don't take it before you have to drive or forklift operator, et cetera. The, the hepatic impairment I mentioned, you know, something related to adverse effects. Be concerned about the liver here. Um, Drug-drug interaction. So this is something that you have to be worried about with this medication. So put a star by that. Special populations. So um, elderly is, you want, may want to be more cautious, just prescribe it more um conservatively, lower doses, et cetera. Um, and then smokers, so tobacco smokers. Um, tobacco smoking actually induces the CYP1A2. Um, so then the medication is actually is decreased in smokers compared to non-smokers. And so it may not be as effective for people who smoke tobacco. So that is interesting, right? No. Okay. Summary recommendations. Go ahead and read through all of these. And that is it for my treatment of insomnia. So as always, email me if you have any questions. Thank you guys for your time and attention, and I'll talk to you later.